So you are almost done with this class, and I'll bet some of you can't wait to be done with me and never hear from me again. So congratulations, you've made it this far. Remember, since a lot of these are available through YouTube, you'll have access to those past the ending of the class. If you need something to put you to sleep at night or you're going to study for your NCLEX exam and you found these lectures helpful, remember you do have access to those through my channel on YouTube. All right, last chance. If you have missed any quizzes, doesn't matter if it was quiz two, clear back at the very beginning of the semester, this is my I'm feeling generous moment. And if you've missed any quizzes, what you need to do is send me an email. If you're listening to this, then I know that you're at least somewhat concerned. If you're hearing me say this and you want to send me an email and say, could you please open up quiz whatever, 8 between 8 to 11 in the morning on December whatever, then I would be willing to do that. But you have to take the step to contact me via email and let me know when you want that quiz open. The drawback is you get one chance at it, okay? Um, final quiz, it's going to work just like your weekly quizzes. In fact, I just put a note up. It's worth, it, there are 12 questions. It's worth 20 points, and there's the potential for four points extra credit. So it's not even as lengthy as your midterm quiz was. It's Blackboard based. You take it just like you did the rest of your quizzes. The grades, because this quiz needs to be open a week, it's open through the week of finals, so you're going to have the same deadline. You need to have it completed next Friday. Um, or the final Friday of, di of finals week, and it needs to be submitted no later than 11 p.m. Then as soon as those are in, I'll get your grade posted on Blackboard, and I'll post those grades to Bronco Web so that they'll show up on your transcripts. If you have any problems or issues, I will be in my office next week. Um, I'll be checking emails, so make sure you uh, get a hold of me if you have a problem with a quiz, okay? So here we go. This is going to be a shorter lecture because it's review and you already are very smart students. So part of what we've discussed this semester has been common symptoms of things. So I want you to look through this list and see how many of these you know. So you could shut off my voice right now and pause it so that you could check your knowledge to see are you clear on what these symptoms would go with. So pause it now. Try to answer and now right upper quadrant pain as opposed to right lower quadrant pain. So do you remember which one's appendicitis and which one is gallbladder? So right upper quadrant pain, that gallbladder sits right under your stomach. So right upper quadrant pain, excuse me, right under the liver, not the stomach. So that would be gallbladder. Right lower quadrant pain is more suspicious for appendicitis. If you had a stiff neck, that would go with meningitis heavy feeling in the chest, left arm pain. This one would go with uh, myocardial infarction, a heart attack. Dizziness and fainting could go with a huge spectrum of things, including panic attacks. It could be neurologic in origin. It could be um, electrolyte in origin. Your electrolytes could be out of balance. That could cause problems with nerve conduction. Dizziness and fainting could be due to blood gases. If you get rid of carbon dioxide too quickly, you feel dizzy and faint. It could be cardiac in origin. Maybe someone had that atrial fibrillation where their heart um, was beating too fast and not giving those ventricles time to fill adequately and then empty adequately. So that one's kind of a big one, huh? Flank pain. So this was the area, if you put your hands on your hips with your thumbs forward, the area that your fingers are covering is the flank, so this was usually suspicious. It could be your back, but if it's sided flank pain, one-sided, that's more suspicious for kidney stones or maybe a kidney infection, a nephritis. Numbness and tingling fingers, toes, that could be from diabetes. That's a complication of diabetes is the neuropathy. It could also be that a person has... Um, Electrolyte imbalances, it could be neurologic disease. So any of those types of things would go with numbness and tingling. It could just be you sat wrong, right? You're sitting in the chair listening to this lecture just drone on and you had numbness and tingling. Headache, that usually looks like neurologic, but that could be related to blood gases. Carbon dioxide again changes the dilation of your blood vessels in your brain. 
dyspnea or orthopnea, that is difficult breathing or positional breathing. So someone says, I can't sleep laying flat. I sleep in a recliner chair, for example, or I have difficulty breathing. That makes us think respiratory system. So we might start with, we in most cases said, try and start with least invasive first. So think of the respiratory system. We'd probably start with a chest x-ray, maybe. With excessive thirst and hunger, that would be um, polydipsia and polyuria. That would be excessive urination. But excessive thirst and hunger goes with um, diabetes. That was a common symptom that went with that. Remember, the person, because they don't have insulin to help the glucose get into the cell, the cell keeps sending out the signal for more energy, more food. And uh, we need to get those patients corrected. So slow growth or onset of puberty, slow onset of puberty, that would make us think things like the adrenal glands or if it was um, an issue of maybe a patient or a person who's small in stature, maybe we think about the pituitary gland. So those um, exocrine glands, the pituitary, adrenal, um, parathyroids, those kinds of things. All right, so now a couple little case studies then. So what if someone went to a health fair and they did a CBC there? So they took some blood and they did a complete blood cell count and they had a monocyte count that was elevated above its normal range. Everything else was fine. So this is to help you remember when we looked at the blood cell differential for white blood cells, we said there were neutrophils was the most common type of white blood cells and typically they help us with bacterial infections. Now they help us with all infections, but they're most effective against bacterial infections. We said uh, the my mind just went like neutrophils, and we had eosinophils, and they elevate with fungal infection, or excuse me, with um, allergic reactions. We have lymphocytes, which are elevated primarily with a viral infection. Do you remember monocytes? And that one was typically the fungal infection. Uh, basophils was blood cancers is the main thing that will cause them to be elevated above their normal range. So if everything else was the same and you haven't had any symptoms, we might just monitor it or we might ask you some screening questions to see if maybe you do have some sort of fungal infection. What is this picture? So we've talked about a KUB radiograph that includes this area of the bodies, the kidney, your ureter, and bladder. And we do KUB films to look at the intestines. But this one is unique, right? It has the contrast media. I can see it in the bladder. I can see it in these ureters. I can see it in the kidneys. So now it's not a KUB film. It is an IVP. It's an IVP because there's contrast media that allows me to see those soft tissues that normally I wouldn't see. So if you see the contrast media there and it's in the kidneys and bladder, that means that you're looking at an IVP film, not just a KUB film. Oh, the dreaded blood gas interpretation. So look at your bicarb, look at your CO2. I didn't even include the oxygen, so you're not having to do that piece. You're not doing a complete assessment of the blood gas. You're doing a partial. So you're looking at, is this acidic or alkaline? And hopefully you remember anything higher than 7.45 is alkaline. Really anything higher than 7.40. The CO2 normal range is 35 to 45. Your bicarb normal range is 22 to 26. So I would write alkaline, normal, alkaline. I've named my disorder. It is a metabolic alkalosis. To look and see if there's compensation, I look at the other parameter, in this case the respiratory one. And I ask myself these questions. Has it moved outside its normal range? No. So therefore, I give it a name, uncompensated metabolic alkalosis. I know that it's not a respiratory acidosis because this isn't an acidosis. And it isn't the respiratory system that's causing the problem. So I know that I could throw that one out. It's not an uncompensated respiratory alkalosis because even though this is alkalosis, if it was the respiratory system causing it, the CO2, the pressure of carbon dioxide in the artery would be less than 35 to make it alkalotic, and it's not. So I have a partially, excuse me, an uncompensated metabolic alkalosis. Okay, again, you could look at this one. You can pause. 
the recording so that you could classify this and that would be a good thing to practice. So pause me and come up with it. If you answered that it's an acidosis, you got it correct. If you then looked at it and said, gosh, the carbon dioxide is the acid and when carbon dioxide goes up, pH goes down. So I think I have a respiratory acidosis. And sure enough, the bicarb moved in an alkaline direction. So I have a respiratory acidosis. And the bicarb has moved outside its normal range, but it has not been able to bring that pH back in the full uh, range of 735 to 745. So I have a partially compensated respiratory acidosis. It's respiratory because that's the one causing the acidosis. If bicarb was causing it, bicarb would have to be low, and then it would be a metabolic acidosis. This one, CO2 is elevated above its normal range of 35 to 45. Um, now we have a white blood cell count, and we have a differential, because here's the differential piece. Those are usually reported as percentages, but they might be reported as numbers. To get that, remember, all they've done is look at your total white blood cell count, 11,000. They've multiplied it by 0 .60. In the case of this one, they just made it a decimal, and you come up with an exact number if you wanted to do it that way. So let's see what you've got. You have a white blood cell count that, would, that is within its normal range. You have a neutrophil count that's normal, a lymphocyte count. So you could look through these and see which ones are normal and abnormal. So, so far, the white blood cell count and differential are okay. Let's look at the red blood cell because we have a CBC. So is the person anemic? Do they have a white blood cell count less than normal? And this is a good place to remind you, remember, red blood cells are present in the millions. White blood cells and platelets only present in the thousands. So we have a decreased red blood cell count. That makes sense. We'd have a decreased hemoglobin. We have a pattern that if we know the hemoglobin, we could multiply it by three. Look at all the things that you've learned or been able to apply. And then we had these things called those red blood cell indices or things that tell us more about the red blood cells. We have a person who has then anemia and as expected their crit is lower than it should be, their hemoglobin is lower than it should be, and they have a sedimentation rate test. The sed rate was remember just letting red blood cells settle out in um, a beaker or a container, not a I guess not a beaker, but in a setting where they're anticoagulated so that it's not because of clotting they're falling out. But remember when red blood cells became sticky, and they become sticky when there's inflammation or infection. So sed rate was a nonspecific way that as my sed rate goes up, and I'm not saying this patient has an increased sed rate because they don't, but when sed rates increase, it tells you there's inflammation or infection. So this person, the main problem on their CBC that it's revealed is an anemia. Here we have a chemistry profile. So we could count the number of tests that they did. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have a chem nine, and I could look at what do the results show. So you could pause the video again and identify what's abnormal and what that might mean. So you could practice. Here's our renal profile. This person's kidneys look okay. Here we look at their risk of heart disease, cholesterol. We look at albumin. Remember that the liver produced that primary protein of the blood called albumin. Here's another test that looks at liver. It's the one that's not specific for the liver. LDH will also elevate if there's damage to the cardiac tissues or the kidneys. Bilirubin's a waste product. When red blood cells break down, the kidney, or excuse me, the liver is supposed to convert it to a type of waste product that can be excreted in your urine. Your liver enzymes. So we know that this one, AST, do you remember that's not the one that focuses specifically on the liver? That was ALT, but AST is nonspecific again. It elevates when there's damage to cardiac tissue, liver tissue. So I don't really have one that's liver specific. I do have an elevated LDH, so maybe the person had some cardiac in origin, but I'd expect my AST will elevate. But you remember I showed you a chart that showed some of these come back to baseline pretty quickly. And maybe that's what we're dealing with. So bilirubin's elevated. The direct bilirubin's elevated. So 
it looks like if they have liver involvement, it's more um, something that's been going on long enough to affect the bilirubin to some degree. So maybe they have a, a case of chronic liver function tests, a bone profile. Do you remember we talked about the ALP? And we could use those L's to, as just a way to remember liver and placenta, even though that's not what they mean. So this person's ALT is elevated. That is the one that's specific for the liver. So we know their liver's involved. If your liver's not working correctly, it makes sense your albumin or your protein levels would be low. That could also be low because your diet is poor. The GGT test was the one that was nonspecific. It can elevate if there's damage to kidneys, to liver, to cardiac. We have a CRP. And do you remember our CRP? That was a test that is a screening tool to look for inflammation or infection. So when your CRP is elevated, your SED rate would probably be elevated because SED rates elevate with infection and inflammation and CRP levels do that. So if this patient were started on antibiotics, we'd hope these CRP levels go down. But think about this. This person has liver involvement. Maybe we're dealing with a patient who has hepatitis or something. That itis is an infection. That would cause the CRP levels to be elevated, the ALT levels to be elevated. Here's a chest x-ray. So what's wrong? Here's our normal looking lung. Remember, it's as if the person is facing you. So this is actually their right lung and their left lung. And that makes sense because the heart is mainly left-sided. We said on x-rays, air should be more black, bone should be dense. And so we have the heart that's more dense than the lung, but the bone that's the densest. So this is not normal. This person has a right upper lobe, and you can actually see it follow that line of the lobe. Pneumonia or consolidation or infiltrate, something that's primarily affecting that right upper lobe and a little bit of that right middle lobe. That is not normal, huh? Here's a CBC. And they're a patient, I guess, some lab values. Their CBC was normal. Their sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarb are. Your chloride's a little bit low. Your blood glucose is a little bit high, but they notice or they notify us that it was a random sample, so they weren't fasting or anything. Your B and creatinine and liver enzymes were normal, so your kidney and liver are most likely okay. But in your urine, you have a lot of glucose, a lot of protein. And remember, all these should be zero. You shouldn't have blood. You shouldn't have ketones. So because we've got an increased glucose level and then all these results, we probably have someone who has undiagnosed diabetes or maybe they were a patient we knew had diabetes. And I guess you could kind of see a similar thing maybe in a person who is under a lot of stress, whether that's... Um, Maybe being in an intensive care unit can cause that kind of stress, or maybe even a pregnant woman might have some of these results that we'd follow. What are they doing here? So the person's laying on their side, kind of bending their back, arching their back. So this is a lumbar puncture, usually done to check for meningitis, but it could also be therapeutic to relieve pressure. Here's a CT. I know it's a CT and not an MRI because it doesn't have the fine tissue detail that we can get. We're getting better and better with our CT machines and with helical CT. And what they're pointing to is the heart. So this is the liver over here, heart. And we're seeing some fluid in this sac around the heart. So a pericardial effusion is what that's called. And that tissue or that fluid is fairly dense because huh? look at what color it is. But you can see the lining of the heart, or the heart, and then I see the sac around it, and normally that should be really tight into it. The person also has a little bit of fluid in their chest, in their pleural space, or a little bit of a pleural effusion. This is a Doppler ultrasound study. We can see a little kink in a blood vessel, but the good news is they do have blood supply to it. We have really good detail of a knee. We can see the soft tissue. We can see the bone. So what procedure was used to get that image? So MRIs are for soft tissue detail. Here is a patient's results from, um, I guess these are typically the tests they do if you're going to get an uh, insurance policy. And I think these are actually for myself or my husband. I think these are my husband's. So there I'm telling you. 
So because he was applying for life insurance, it's common that they would check for HIV. They'd check for hemoglobin A1C. Do you remember that would look at your risk of diabetes and it looks at a longer window of time than just one blood test. Um, it also helps us identify patients that are more at risk for the complications of diabetes. Remember with diabetics, we're trying to keep that hemoglobin A1C number less than 7. So as you look through his results, the biggest thing he had a problem with, and he's still battling this, is he has an elevated amount of bad cholesterol and too low of his high density lipoprotein. See how they're on the very low end? This is the helpful lipoprotein, the one that helps get rid of cholesterol in your body. It's the one that is the good healthy fish oils, that kind of thing. So he's taking a fish oil supplement to try and bring this one up. We'd like this one to be higher and we'd like the bad cholesterol, the low density lipoproteins to be lower. And I think that was all that was really significant on his. Notice how they checked for tobacco use or the legal drug use in a person and the diuretic agents they're looking for that um, that could we have patients on diuretics who have lung or heart disease but also they could be looking for um, where you may be taking something to clear stuff out of your urine like you're trying to cheat the drug test all right that didn't take very long did it so a little bit of a review um, your final quiz will be similar in nature Again, I have that offer out there. You could make up any missed quizzes if you're really concerned about that and you're showing me that you're dedicated to the class by listening to this video and hearing that message. Contact me by email and let me know. If you have any questions with your quiz or if you have questions about the class, you're always welcome to contact me by phone or email. You have that information on the course syllabus and at the website. So thanks for spending time with me and I appreciate this opportunity to have you in class.